Montana, 1836. In the middle of the night, in the dead of winter, a fur trapper named Isaac P. Rose shakes himself free from the warmth of the buffalo robe he has been sleeping in and rises to his feet. In a daze, the man wanders into the freezing, ominous darkness of the woods that surround him and his companion's small campsite. He trudges to a spot a few dozen yards away, feeling inexplicably drawn to a small clearing just beyond the tree line. As he comes into view of the clearing, he is shocked to see the hulking figure of a lone grizzly bear. For the veteran mountain man, the sight of a grizzly here in the wilds near Clark's Fork on the Yellowstone River is not at all unusual. However, this grizzly is standing on his hind legs, nearly eight feet tall, and staring intently at the bewildered man. Locking eyes with Rose, the bear walks up to the man, striding in an eerily human-like gait, and speaks. He tells Rose, in a deep, steady voice, to shake his hand. Rose, more confused than afraid, offers the hulking beast his left hand. The bear refuses to take it. Rose, sensing the animal's offense, hurriedly extends his right hand instead. At this, the bear silently and solemnly shakes the man's hand with both of its massive paws. Then, the bear suddenly disappears with a gust of icy wind. Just as suddenly, Rose finds himself awakened by the morning sun, still wrapped in the warm buffalo blanket. It had all, of course, been a dream. Rose and his fellow mountain men, party composed of himself, as well as Joe Meek, Jack Larison, and Mark Head, have departed from their main company in order to procure meat for their starving comrades. The main party, under the leadership of the legendary mountain man Jim Bridger, are camped 30 miles away. They are counting on their comrades to ease the troublesome burden of surviving the harsh winter at hand. They have thus far been successful, as they have managed to kill so many buffalo that, after one day's hunt, four of the eight horses that had been brought along to pack the meat now find themselves burdened by full loads. The snow is deep, and travel has been slow. With another long, cold day ahead of them, the fur trappers begin to pack their things and make ready for travel. As they do this, Rose recounts his strange dream for his companions, partly for their amusement, and partly hoping one of them might proffer an explanation as to the meaning of it. He tells them how Caleb, the colloquial name amongst mountain men for the grizzly bear, had come to him in a dream, that he had spoken and only shaken his right hand. Joe Meek, another veteran trapper, shakes his head and lowers his concerned eyes on Rose. You had better look out, Rose, or you'll shake hands with Beelzebub before night. While the grizzly bear certainly instills a healthy sense of respect and fear in any mountain man, what they fear most is coming into contact with Beelzebub. Though his name is used in the New Testament as a synonym for the devil, that is not the image that comes to the typical trapper's mind when they hear the word. For these men, the most fearful entity that they might encounter here in the wilds thousands of miles from their places of birth is not the grizzly, nor is it the venomous snakes, buffalo stampedes, wolves, mountain lions, flash floods, avalanches, or wildfires. For the mountain men, their greatest fear is the Blackfoot. The Blackfoot, or Siksika, had originated in the northeast, near the area between the modern-day state of Maine and Canada. They would eventually make their way to the Great Lakes region, and then even further west onto the expanses of the Great Plains of present-day Alberta, Canada, and the state of Montana. They had subsisted in these unforgiving environs for centuries as foot-bound hunters. Before the introduction of the horse into the Blackfoot culture in the 18th century, they had survived by chasing bison herds off of cliffs, gathering at the bottom to butcher the animals. Their cultural transformation to a horse-based people who hunted, conducted warfare, and traveled on horseback was delayed far longer than the tribes further to the south. This was due more to geography than anything else, as the Blackfoot's northerly location placed them farther away from the large populations of horses found in Mexico and Texas. But, however delayed their transformation might have been, it has also been incredibly rapid and incredibly consequential on the northern plains. The Blackfoot had quickly mastered hunting and fighting from atop charging mounts 
and had proven the most formidable power in the area for decades by the time Isaac Rose and his comrades sauntered into their territory in the 1830s. During the winter months, which could amount to more than half the year in these northernmost reaches of the Great Plains, the Blackfoot would set up their villages in the wooded river valleys. On the rare occasion that they ventured out from these quarters, it was generally to partake in the same practice that Rose and his companions were partaking in. They would hunt the buffalo herds that hunkered down in the wooded areas and harvest as many as they could carry back in order to sustain their families and community until the long-awaited end of winter. The buffalo was more than simply a main food source of the Blackfoot. For the Blackfoot, nearly every tool and furnishing at their disposal came, in some form or fashion, from the buffalo. Properly known as the American bison or Plains bison, they are the largest land animal on the North American continent. The largest males can weigh upwards of 2,000 pounds and can be incredibly unpredictable. They roam virtually the entirety of the middle of the continent, from northern Canada to Mexico, in what is known as the Bison Belt. At their peak, most experts estimate their population to range from 30 to 50 million, with some estimates being as high as 75 million. Their thick hides provide the material with which the Blackfoot and other plains tribes construct their teepees. Their bones, hooves, and horns are used to construct tools and cooking utensils. Bison meat is, of course, the basis of the Blackfoot diet. Roasted, fried, boiled, dried, or raw, it could be prepared and consumed in a variety of manners. A particular delicacy for many Plains tribes was to squirt the bile from the gallbladder into the cavernous open stomach of a freshly killed lactating female buffalo. This created a yogurt of sorts that many children saw as a treat. To the Blackfoot, the buffalo are a sacred gift from their creator, their way of life, and their livelihood. As such, they see fit to protect their resources by any means necessary. Since the buffalo herds are such an important resource for the Blackfoot, any incursion into their territory, and especially any hunting of the buffalo on that territory, is seen as an offense punishable by death. Hugh Monroe, a Canadian fur trapper who was adopted into the Blackfoot, gives his account of how viciously the Blackfoot dealt with intruders, even of other native tribes. After finding a still smoldering campfire of a neighboring tribe referred to as the River People, the Blackfoot whom Monroe was living with became inconsolably irate and set on revenge. He asked one warrior, a man named Lone Walker, what had happened. Monroe's account is as follows. The campers here were the River People, said Lone Walker. We had forbidden them to come over here on our plains, but they keep coming and stealing our buffaloes. We shall now make them cry. You are going to fight them? asked Monroe. Yes, said Lone Walker. I shivered, recalls Monroe. In my mind's eye, I saw a great battle, arrows flying and guns booming, and men falling and crying out in their death and agony. And for what? Just a few buffaloes that blackened the plains. Don't fight, pleaded Monroe. There are plenty of buffalo. Let the river people go in peace with what they have killed. But the Canadian recalled. He gave me no answer other than a grim smile and rode out to meet the head of the Blackfoot call. In the ensuing fight, the Blackfoot would kill seven of the river people's warriors as their women and children fled in desperate panic. All seven would be scalped and otherwise mutilated as both punishment and warning. Afterwards, a great celebration would be held. The fur trappers are well aware of the danger their venture has placed them in. However, they are also aware that the buffalo meat they return to their company with could quite literally be the difference between a relatively comfortable winter and possibly starving to death in the middle of nowhere. And so, for the time being, they are not dissuaded from their job at hand. The four men continue on with their day, spending it much the same as they had the day before. Rose, the most reliable shot, would fall a buffalo, and then they would all set into quartering and packing the meat. However, after seeing several hundred of the animals, they have proven so unusually skittish that Rose could not get close enough for a good shot. This suspicious behavior spells only one sure thing, according to the mountain man's instincts, that the Blackfoot are nearby. The trappers agree that the best course of action is to return to camp with the buffalo meat they have been able to procure so far. 
They head southeast through rolling hills. As the men ride, conversation is kept to a minimum, and their eyes continually scan the landscape around them. They are well aware that being caught with a bounty of buffalo meat will likely spell a torturous end at the hands of the Blackfoot. This end could certainly come by a variety of tortures routinely employed by almost all Plains tribes. These include being staked out in the summer sun, burned under red-hot coals, or quite literally being carved to pieces as their torturers, along with the women and children, laugh at and chide them. But a hard death could also, as Isaac Rose and company had found out only a few weeks earlier, be suffered even after escaping from a Blackfoot attack. A Delaware tribesman named Manhead, who had been traveling with the fur company, had been out hunting with Rose when the pair were suddenly attacked by a small group of Blackfoot warriors. Rose and Manhead had managed to make it back to camp, with Manhead suffering only a flesh wound from a bullet in his calf. But as they reached camp, Manhead informed Rose that he had been hit with a dreaded poison bullet, and his demise was all but certain. Over the succeeding hours, the unfortunate Delaware would suffer an agonizing death. In his biographical work on Isaac Rose titled Four Years in the Rockies, author James B. Marsh addresses the reader directly in how these poison bullets were made. Perhaps our readers may not be aware of the method resorted to by the Indians in poisoning their bullets. It is done this way. A small piece of buffalo meat is placed on the end of a forked stick, and a rattlesnake is induced to strike his fangs into it. This poisoned meat is then dried, pounded into a powder, and placed in a small bag. When the Indian intends to use one of these poisoned bullets, he first puts it in his mouth and chews it for some time, then dips it into the bag, and the slightest wounds from one of these bullets can cause death. As the trappers try to push these fears from their minds and focus on the task at hand, they feel an inexorable tension as the undulating terrain provides ample cover for a Blackfoot ambush. All they can hope for now is to make it back to their company's main camp and the comparative safety and numbers it provides. After a few hours of riding, it seems as though they might actually make it. Then, just as they are about to reach a small ravine, a party of eight Blackfoot spring up, screaming their defiant, powerful war cries. The lead Blackfoot warrior is scarcely ten feet from Rose when the attack begins. Rose, in the lead, wheels his horse and is now the closest target for the Blackfoot to attack. Almost as suddenly as he can turn his horse to flee, the air is filled with the roar of gunfire and Blackfoot musket balls whiz all around him. One of the balls passes through his cap, while another rips across his chest, leaving a jagged but shallow cut across his skin and cutting the strings of his shot pouch, causing the critical piece of weaponry to fall to the ground. Another ball passes through the wrist of his buckskin glove, again miraculously only causing minor superficial damage to his wrist. Rose's most grievous wound comes when one of the lead balls smashes into his right elbow. The ball enters just above the joint and exits through the forearm, rendering the limb all but useless for the time being. The Blackfoot warrior nearest Rose, seeing he is now incapacitated, rides forward to finish the attack. The warrior attempts to grab Rose's horse by its bridle with one hand while attempting to shove Rose from the animal. Rose uses his severely injured right hand to hang on to the reins while he repeatedly strikes the Blackfoot warrior in the face with his riding whip. As he does this, Rose's horse panics and lurches away from the Blackfoot, taking off in a dead run in the direction of the other trappers. This is a fortuitous break for Rose, however, as the horse wheels around to make their escape, Rose's rifle falls from his lap. Rose realizes he is severely wounded, and now without any means of defense save for his hunting knife and tomahawk. His only hope is to hang on as his horse makes a mad dash away from the Blackfoot. He urges the animal onward, doing all he can to hang on to the reins with his one working arm. Looking behind him, he sees the Blackfoot warrior closest in pursuit stop to pick up Rose's valuable rifle from the ground fumbling with the rifle's leather scabbard. Rose again turns his gaze forward, hunkering down as low as possible next to the horse's neck. Then, he hears a sound he is well familiar with, the crack of his own rifle, followed by the sound of yet another ball whizzing by his head. 
Rose's charging steed manages to catch up to the party of three other trappers whose retreat has been slowed by their heavily burdened pack animals. Seeing no better option, Jack Larison cuts the straps holding the loads to the animals, leaving hundreds of pounds of meat spilling upon the rolling prairie. Larison calls out to Rose, Are you killed, old boy? Not killed, but badly wounded, Rose replies. Hurry forward, boys, and save yourselves if you can. Rose and his cohorts must now cover over 30 miles of prairie in order to get back to the safety of their company. In another fortuitous break for the party, the Blackfoot have halted their pursuit in order to reclaim the buffalo meat dropped by the trappers. Though they are now empty-handed, they are all alive. Rose, however, is beginning to rapidly decline over the course of the ride. His arm throbs in immense pain, and he is wrought with nausea and dizziness. For hours, he rides through icy winds and over snow-covered grounds, his right arm dangling uselessly by his side. It is soon apparent that at least one of his wounds is the result of a poisoned bullet. As the four trappers finally reach camp, it is readily apparent to all that Rose is on the verge of death. He is pulled off of his horse and carried into a tent, where Jim Bridger and a Delaware medicine man examine him. Both concur that he is the victim of a poisoned bullet, and has likely only survived this long due to the blood loss he had incurred during his ride. Over the next few days, Rose lies in the tent battling for his life against the effects of the poison and blood loss. His arm swells to a nearly unrecognizable mass, causing fissures in the skin at the shoulder. His nervous system becomes, in his own later words, fearfully disorganized, and even the slightest noise, light, or motion causes him great distress. His fellow trappers do all within their power to care for him though little can be done other than keeping the wound clean and letting the man sleep as best he can. Most of his friends fear, if not outright assume, he will not survive long. However, after about a week, the wound has begun to heal. Soon, Rose is able to eat and walk, and within weeks he will be back to work, hunting and trapping. However, Rose will scarcely have regained the ability to hold down food by the time an injured scout limps into camp, seemingly in a full froth panic. The scout, a Mexican man known as Masayeno, has been shot in the ankle, though thankfully not by a poison bullet, and had only escaped certain death at the hands of a roving band of Blackfoot by hurling himself off of a steep cliff which they were not willing to follow him down. Masayeno reports that the Blackfoot are coalescing in a winter camp on the Yellowstone River, four miles south of the trapper's location. The village is nearly a thousand lodges strong, he says, and when they discover the trapper's location, the trappers will surely be wiped out. And so, the fight for the frontier will continue. Bridger will order his men to construct a makeshift fort, and the men will hunker down for what will be one of the most brutal encounters between native tribes and mountain men in the history of the Old West. But for tonight, the accounts of that battle as well as the countless other tales of conflict and coexistence between tribespeople and trappers, are other stories for other times. Thank you for tuning into this episode of History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to click like, share this episode with a friend, be sure to subscribe, and if you'd like to support our work, click the link below in the description to become a subscriber on Patreon. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, History to Real for the Western.